Hello and welcome. I'm John Verico, Chief of Media and Community Relations at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate, or s and I'll be your moderator for today's virtual first responder Capitol Hill Showcase. We're glad you're here with us. Today, we've convened first responders from across the nation and experts from across s and who are working to help improve emergency response and critical decision making in times of crisis. They'll share insights on the important role that science and technology plays in providing important tools to first responders in communities like yours. Now, our goal is to provide you with a window into the work that s and is doing to help save lives, reduce injury, and decrease costs of effective technologies. We continuously search for what responders need by engaging directly with representatives from fire services, emergency medical, and law enforcement agencies. But before we move on, a few housekeeping notes about our live chat. If you have questions, please place them in the chat, which is now open. s and colleagues are on hand to monitor the chat and to respond. And we'll try to get to as many questions as possible in the chat, and we have time reserved at the end for our speakers to address a few questions. For questions that we don't get to today, We'll post a capture of today's chat activity on the ST Hill ST's Hill Showcase webpage so you can learn more about the impact of ST's R&D investments. But first, let's set the stage. I'm now pleased to introduce ST's senior official performing the duties of the Undersecretary for Science and Technology, Katherine Coulter Mitchell. Thank you, John. On behalf of DHS leadership, I'd like to thank the Honorable Chairwoman Yvette Clark, who is the chair of the House Homeland Security Committee's Subcommittee on Homeland Cybersecurity, Infrastructure Protection, and Innovation. Congresswoman Clark, thank you for your leadership and support. Your remarks help set the tone for why this virtual showcase is so important. To our congressional audience, first responders nationwide, DHS components, administration partners, and stakeholders across the Homeland Security enterprise, thank you for joining us today. We are here today to inform and educate you on the impacts of our research, development, and innovation, and explain how these technologies are improving first responder capabilities and protecting our way of life. To my DHS colleagues and first responders nationwide, which are many, s and is grateful for your hard work and dedication to keep our country safe, secure, and resilient. For those who may not realize, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security's Science and Technology Directorate has statutory responsibilities to invest in science and research to develop innovative technologies to enhance the safety and efficiency for all first responder disciplines across the country. At s and our priority is to drive down risks and save lives. Our job is to understand the challenges and growing demands facing all of our security operators and focus on our research on improving emergency response and agile decision making. Over the next few minutes, as you hear from first responders and s and scientists and engineers, I encourage you to engage our presenters and think about what problem set is this technology solving? How could this solution benefit my hometown? For example, does it reduce injuries, save time, money, and lives? What do my first responders and emergency managers back home need for the adoption or integration of these solutions? Where should they go to learn more? At s and we recognize the urgency of getting the right technologies into the hands of the brave men and women who risk their lives to protect us. The solutions we are showcasing today are the result of extensive cross-sector collaboration and partnerships from our DHS components, 10 DHS academic centers of excellence, five national labs, and seven technology centers. To ensure we're solving the right problems, we engage first responders to define requirements. This informs our rd &I investments and efforts to scout technologies, leverage existing investments, perform testing and evaluation, and facilitate the transition and commercialization of technologies into operational use. s and Paul McDonough and first responders will sp be speaking to this next. By engaging industry innovators and smart cities planners, which is what our experts will be discussing in a few minutes, 
ST is leading the conversation across the federal government research community on how to build and sustain smart, resilient, and secure communities. So let me stop there. Thank you all for what you're doing to save lives and help our country prosper and stay safe. Enjoy this interactive conversation, get connected, and let us know what you think. Back to John. So let's get into this now. The real reason why we're all here today. We'll hear from the front line. We're thrilled to be joined by responders who represent a cross section of disciplines in emergency response nationwide. While each responder discipline and jurisdiction face their own unique challenges, they share an unbreakable bond of keeping our communities safe. With us today is Dr. Carol Cunningham, State Medical Director for Ohio EMS, Daniel Dooley, an inspector with NYPD, and Steve Vanderwall, a San Diego firefighter helicopter rescue medic. And this discussion will be led by Paul McDonough, SMT's first responder disaster resilience portfolio portfolio manager and an experienced first responder with 38 years in law enforcement. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. And thank you to our guest speakers who are here today. And before I start, I would like to advise those attending our session what your what our responders provide to the Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate through what we call the Science and Technology First Responder Resource Group. The group is a collection of volunteers from our first responder communities from across the nation. They agree to pass on their expertise and their knowledge so we at DHS can determine if we can find, improve, or sometimes create a solution to make responders better at what they do. We are actively working on a wildland firefighter respirator to make those firefighters safer in that dangerous environment. And this is a current example of where DHS s and is committed to making our responders protected, connected, and fully aware so they can keep our community safe. Currently, our first responder resource group has 150 members from 36 different states. We are fortunate to have three of our members from the First Responder Resource Group with us here today, and I'd like to thank you all for being here with us. With that, when we have our discussion, I'd like to discuss how our process works with you for understanding your special problem sets, and then those problem sets that play a role in enabling you to do your job safely and more effectively. And what does our audience need to know about working with DHS so we can deliver solutions and enhance capabilities for your operations? To start, Dr. Carol Cunningham. Carol, truly a difficult and challenging year. Does your experience tie into what you do with the First Responder Resource Group? Thanks, Paul, absolutely. Uh, for EMS personnel, the second cause of injury, which is greater than 20%, is due to a harmful exposure or environment. s and has helped to mitigate these hazards. Uh, the s and funded wearable smart chemical sensor badge provides early detection and responder notification of toxic substances that facilitates avoidance of the toxin and also improves the selection of the appropriate PPE to, drop, to don. Uh, many toxic substances are not visible with the naked eye or are odorless. Um, s and work on early detection technologies protects the workforce acutely and ultimately will maintain the workforce as short-term and long-term effects of these substances can be life-threatening or career-ending. The rates of cardiopulmonary arrest in EMS providers while on duty remains above the national average. s and has helped reduce the incidence of cardiopulmonary arrest in EMS through s and research and development of a personal monitoring tag. In addition to sensing when the body is adversely affected by environmental exposure, the physiologic monitor can also sense when the first responder's body is being overworked or is losing its ability to auto-regulate its core temperature and advise the responder or incident command of a need for rest. Physiologic monitoring for emergency responders is the focus of a market survey report prepared by s and National Urban Security Technology Laboratory, also known as NUSTL. 
Uh, the lab has been a crucial resource for first responders. Uh, due to the development of these products and others with taxpayer dollars by DHS, these investments are affordable for all first responders. On behalf of the First Responder Resource Group, I thank you for your vital support. Thank you, Dr. Cunningham. I, a quick follow up, if you don't mind. How has COVID changed the response environment for you? Well, the COVID pandemic has identified additional gaps in the first responder protection uh, that ST is working to address in coordination with the first responder community. A badge that is capable of early detection of highly contagious infectious pathogens is needed. Um, we also need to look at an affordable device uh, that's capable of generating a negative pressure environment inside the transport vehicle uh, to enhance the protection of EMS clinicians providing care. Very good. Well, thank you, Dr. Cunningham. If I could ask you to stick around for a moment. Next up is Inspector Daniel Dooley with the New York City Police Department. He is currently assigned to the Office of Professional Development. And Daniel, we talked earlier today. Would you care to share your thoughts about the benefits of the first responder resource group has that group has beyond doing projects? Yeah, so good morning, everybody. Um, so my name is Dan Dooley. I am currently an inspector with the New York City Police Department. I serve as the commanding officer for the Office of Professional Development. I have like this unique ability to teach and coach, so I also serve as the lead instructor for executive development in my agency. So the power of the first resource response group, the value of the FRG, I can sum up in one word, right? Networking. Right? The FRG brings together large first responder agencies like the NYPD, which are much smaller agencies. So we can kind of bounce ideas off each other, leverage our connective knowledge, see what works in our agency, what works in yours, and maybe what doesn't, right? Because let's face it, some of the technology and the policies that go along with it may not may work in uh, a large urban environment like New York City, but maybe it won't in a small rural envi environment, say in like, you know, Minnesota. But more importantly, the FRG lets agencies know that you're not alone, like you're not alone. There is a form of talented, highly educated, highly trained, highly motivated first responders from all over the country who are available. They're a resource to you to help you make those agency changing, sometimes life changing decisions. Thank you for that. And Carol mentioned uh, the National Urban Security Technology Lab or New Steel, and that's located in New York City. Yeah. How has New Steel been working with your organization, the NYPD or FDNY? Yes, yeah, so well, beyond the FRG, uh, one of ST's best resources for responders is the SAVER program, and that's run by New Steel, right, in New York City. So savers like that are consumer reports for first responders and informs what technologies agencies like the NYPD would look to buy. Okay, thank you for that. I appreciate that. For the sake of time, I'm gonna move on to uh, rescue paramedic Steve Vanderwall from San Diego Fire and Rescue. Uh, Steve, you have been with the FRG for a while and worked on a few projects. Care to share your thoughts on what FRG or the First Responder Resource Group has done for the first responder community as a whole? Sure, yeah, there's a particular project that comes to mind that um, that came out of a network, just like what Danny was just talking about, networking with first responders. Um, we're talking about how uh, new technology doesn't always involve a battery or, or a resistor. Um, and we, what we really needed was a new structure firefighting glove. Uh, if I go to a burning house, I need to feel the door for heat. And if I, uh, if I take my glove off to do that, um, it's sometimes hard to put a glove back on. Sometimes the liner will turn inside out, my hand will get all sweaty, and it gets very difficult, and that's an unreasonable delay. And so uh, we decided to approach the FRRG and say, hey, can you do something for us? And, uh, and it wasn't just an issue of putting the glove on and off. Dexterity was an issue. Um, so s and took on this, this challenge to make a better structure firefighting glove. And uh, they got together first responders to help describe what a real advancement in a new structure glove would look like. And s and was able to bring together an industry leader, uh, the health and safety uh, entities that, that provide that service for firefighters, along with a, uh, a, a textile 
uh, company that had a nanotechnology fabric that really made it a new improvement for a glove. Um, and it produced, produced a new glove that set a whole new standard, and it sells real well, and it helps firefighters perform their job more effectively. And that investment by s and didn't just help with that glove. All the other competing manufacturers had to up their game. So in the end, the investment made uh, PPE far better for uh, firefighters across the board. So earlier this morning when we were chatting, you, you were talking about a game changer uh, that s and has been funding development uh, for first responders. I, I'm going to ask, would you mind sharing that with us here today? Yeah, there's one project that, that is very, very exciting. Um, for too many firefighters and also members of Law enforcement tactical teams know the fear and frustration of being lost in a structure or losing someone else in a structure, maybe smoke charge, maybe active shooter. Um, and over the years, FRG tried to find some solution that would track people inside a structure. And some different technologies came around the pike, and none of them were really viable solutions. And so this became the holy grail project for the FRG. Then we started working with NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratories, uh, and they had a brand new technology called Magneto Quasistatics. And so the FRG funded the pointer system, and the pointer system is really, really exciting. Using magnetic waves, it can track a responder through, through walls, through rock, below grade. Um, and the interesting thing was when we started playing with this, it would tell us where people were, but without real good graphics, they would show us um, the, the layout of a structure, where people changed from one floor to another. It didn't mean much. So I've been working with first responders and the scientists at JPL and other industry partners to get a real solution through Pointer. Um, and it's gonna have a profound impact on saving the lives of lost, injured, and trapped firefighters. It's gonna make firefighter and, and SWAT entry teams safer um, and what we're finding is it's not just a way to help uh, lost or or, or uh, stranded firefighters it's also going to help in the day-to-day -day operation uh, inside a structure when people outside can track what's going on inside and then phase two we're going to move outside a little bit which is going to help in the actor shooter envi environment wildland and urban interface um, what's really exciting about this is usually when a new technology comes down the pike takes a long time for it to come down to the response community. And this is the first time that this brand new technology is gonna get applied for first responders, and that's through the FRG. Well, Steve, thank you for that. That's very telling. And actually, I wanna say thank you to the uh, earlier speakers, uh, Dr. Cunningham and Inspector Dooley. Um, I'm gonna ask that you stick around, and we're gonna try to see if we can answer some questions at the end of the session, but I'd like to turn it back over to John. John? Hey, thank you so much, Paul, and thank you, Carol, Dan, and Steve, uh, for being here and for everything you do to keep our community safe every day. So up next, we'll hear from Sean McDonald, Program Manager for s ts Counter Unmanned Aircraft Systems, or CUAS program. Drone technology poses a wide array of challenges for the first responder and critical infrastructure communities, and Sean's program aims to address those challenges in real-world operational environments. Thanks, John. I'll be taking the next few minutes to talk about our federal first responders like Customs and Border Protection, Federal Protective, uh, federal Protective Service, the U.S. Coast Guard, the U.S. Secret Service, that are authorized to respond to drone threats here in the US and how s and is working to make sure that they are using the most effective technology to keep us safe. First slide, please. As I'm sure you're aware, advancements in drones and drone technologies are growing by leaps and bounds every few months. Drone usage has significant positive impacts in areas like medical deliveries, real estate, the TV movie industry, to name a few. However, there are also small groups of individuals that are using them for nefarious means like smuggling drugs across the border disrupting high profile events such as the UN General Assembly or sporting events like the Super Bowl, or using the high resolution cameras on the drones to surveil our critical infrastructure and even surveil movements of our law enforcement personnel. So in 2018, Congress passed the Preventing Emerging Threats Act that provided limited authorization for DHS to detect, track, and mitigate drone threats. At s and a few of our many roles are to assist first responders in documenting their requirements, selecting the best mix of technologies to address those requirements, 
and then testing the performance in both laboratory and operational environments to ensure that they perform well and are safe to deploy. One of our focuses has been ensuring the equipment needed for countering drones is safe and effective. As you could probably guess, most CUS equipment was developed for DOD use overseas. Here within the homeland, we have very tight control over devices that transmit energy through our airwaves, and for good reason. We can't afford to have our medical devices, our police communications, or our aircraft flying overhead negatively impacted if a counter drone device is used. To understand exactly what frequencies and how much power the CUS equipment transmits, we partner with national labs and universities to utilize their special test equipment called anechoic chambers. You can see a picture of an anechoic chamber in the bottom of the current slide with the blue walls and the blue floor. If you look closely, you can also see multiple drones flying with our test equipment on a yellow tripod in the center. Data collected from these tests is then shared with the FAA, NTIA, FCC, so that together we can agree on a safe way to deploy the technology. Sometimes we end up having to go back to the vendor to make changes to their product so they can operate safely within the homeland. In addition to spectrum testing, we're also performing cyber vulnerability tests on the equipment to ensure that there are no unexpected data connections or software vulnerabilities that could put our first responders in danger or provide other countries backdoor access to our operational equipment and data. Second slide, please. Once safety and security testing is complete, we perform extensive field testing right alongside our federal first responders, and most importantly, in the actual environment to document exactly how well the equipment performs. Over the last year, we've executed over 10 tests across the homeland with CBP, Federal Protective Service, Coast Guard, and Secret Service in both cities, uh, both land and maritime ports of entry, and on the southwest border. We're also very aware that DHS isn't the only one working in this space. We have a great relationship with our interagency partners, such as Department of Justice, Department of Defense, Department of State, and the FAA. And on the international front, we also have very strong relationships, relationships with our Five Eyes partners, like Australia, Canada, Great Britain, and New Zealand. We've maintained quarterly virtual meetings during the last couple of COVID years to discuss changes in threats, approaches each country is taking to counter the drone threat, and exchanging test results. And then taking a look forward, we're looking to address future drone threats, such as those that don't emit any signals at all, or those that have modified signals in an attempt to evade detection. Another area we're investing in is the area of multi multiple sim simultaneous drones in the air at one time, which could include a mix of good and bad drones, like at the fireworks uh, shows during 4th of July. These are very tough problems to solve, so we partnered with leading national labs, universities, and industry to help us. And drawing back to my previous comment about our strong ties with the interagency and our international community, we're comparing notes and sharing information on research and development to enable the whole of government and international approach. I think my time's about up, but I want to thank you for allowing me to discuss our counter drone efforts with the federal first responders here today. John, back to you. Hey, thank you so much, Sean. That's it's, it's such a, a, a difficult challenge out there. Up next, we'll hear from Dr. Rosanna Anderson, Prog Program Manager for Opioid Detection, another difficult challenge. And she's leading ST's efforts in combating the opioid epidemic alongside the greater responder community and seeking solutions to a crisis that's claimed hundreds of thousands of lives. Thank you, John. As you said, opioid abuse continues to devastate communities and families across our nation, putting DHS components and our first responders on the front lines of combating the opioid crisis. Over the years, ST has worked closely with those end users, as well as industry, academic, and international partners to improve technologies. Today, I'll quickly highlight three initiatives. First slide, please. In collaboration with the ST. Um, Office of Standards and the Pacific Northwest National Lab, we developed and published international standards that establish guidelines for the consistent, repeatable testing and use of commonly used detection equipment. Following these standards will ensure that the equipment will perform the way it's supposed to and offer the users um, confidence in the results when they have them. Building on that work, we're now putting those standards to use. Through cooperative research and development agreements, we're working with industry partners to 
expand their systems detection library. So basically being able to see more things um, in the field um, with those upgrades offered free of charge to, to users on approximately 20 different commercially available systems. We will then use those upgraded systems and test them against those standards that I just talked about to publish a publicly available type of consumer report that details the performance results, giving responders nationwide the firsthand knowledge that they need to support their future purchases of the most effective equipment to meet their specific needs. Lastly, we realized that there's a lot of information circulating about fentanyl and opioids, but sometimes with little understanding of how that scientific information um, should be used in the context of day-to-day -day operations, and sometimes causing some um, uncertainties of how to approach a potential hazardous situation. So in partnership with the ST Chemical Security Analysis Center, the Probabilistic Analysis of National Threats, Hazards, and Risk Program, we publish a master question list for the response community that provides a comprehensive look at what we know and what we don't and how to put that information to use for protection, response, and future research. So lastly, uh, I, I think my time is also up, but I do thank you for the opportunity to be here and present today. Rosanna, thank you again so much. Uh, as usual, uh, always enlightening uh, to learn about the work that you're doing. We're now going to shift our focus to another major mission, mission area for the department, and that is disaster resilience. Our next speaker, Jeff Booth, is the director of our Sensor and Platform Technology Center, and he'll share the progress of smart sensor technologies that provide early warnings for communities nationwide. Jeff, over to you. Thank you, John. Over the past two years, we've been working with small businesses on the development, operational evaluation, and commercialization of wildland fire and in-building air quality energy sensors. The goal of this applied research is to provide earlier alerts, warnings, and notifications of wildland fire ignitions and indoor air quality incidents of concern. These early detections will allow communities, infrastructure owners, and first responders the ability to better react, mitigate, and possibly prevent catastrophic disasters. Next slide, please. Current wildland fire sensors are typically optical or thermal cameras mounted on towers, aircraft, UAVs, and even satellites. They generally identify fires that are already established, often too late to prevent an outbreak. Our wildfire sensors are being designed to identify ignitions and the earliest stages of wildfire expansion. Our research focuses upon the science of wildfires and their chemical compositions and particulate sizes. The sensors are being designed to apply machine learning over time to refine the detection algorithms and reduce false positives found in the environment. We performed a three-dimensional air pollution and terrain modeling assessment based upon historic wildfire ignition locations and historic meteorological conditions. The models informed follow-on lab tests used in an innovative fire smoke box to provide a combination of smoke and chemical particulate concentrations against distance and time. The analysis simulated multiple scenarios, including extreme Santa Ana winds and typical weather conditions against early fire stages, such as ignition, smoldering, and flaming. The lab test results determined smoke levels and sensor responses were 1,000 times more sensitive than the commercial off-the-shelf alarms and 100 times more than those used in the early industrial fire detection systems. With the combined results of the air modeling and tech lab burn scenarios, a prescribed burn over a two-day period was performed to field test and evaluate the sensors in an operational real-world setting. Next slide, please. A 1,000 acre prescribed burn was performed in Northern California on the Nature Conservancy lands as part of a CAL FIRE first responder firefighting training exercise. Stakeholders from federal, state, local authorities observed the field test. The sensors were able to detect multiple ignitions given wind speeds and environmental conditions, distinguish a new ignition versus background smoke, and validate the initial detection algorithms. Further enhancements to the algorithms, the form factor, and the communications have continued in preparation for an operational test and evaluation planned for this fire season from July to December. 
We will deploy 200 sensors to further evaluate the efficacy of the sensors and develop commercialization paths with the performers and the stakeholder community. Next slide, please. To address the many challenges faced by critical infrastructure owner operators and such as public safety, soft targets, COVID, and energy savings, we initiated a public-private partnership with Capital One Arena and its building operator, Monumental Sports. The resulting in-building sensor test bed addressed three primary functions, building monitoring, building energy performance, and building safety. We selected use cases to understand and predict performance costs, optimize building performance, and expedite post-COVID safety procedures. We built a three-dimensional digital twin, deployed sensor pods around the arena and bowl with a variety of environmental sensors and performed dynamic airflow modeling to assess conditions over time as venues were reconfigured from sporting events, concerts, and exhibitions, each requiring different HVAC air handling conditions and refresh cycles. Their sensor pod architecture was integrated into the existing building management system, and for the first time, building operators could visualize the changing environmental conditions mapped to the air handling procedures to determine system efficiencies and identify performance enhancement measures to improve operations and safety. Next slide, please. The public-private partnership resulted in improved building operations for air refresh cycles that exceeded NBA, NHL, and the city requirements, which allowed increases in event occupancy during COVID. The building automation system enhance, enhancements resulted in a 70% improvement in HVAC procedures with an estimated cost savings of over $1 million, making the public safety measures cost neutral for an owner operator. Our sensors and platform improvements allowed for blue force tracking and monitoring, artificial intelligence integrated into existing arena camera networks for covert protocols, such as six foot social distancing and masking, crowd flow modeling for evacuations, and it supports government regulations, such as the building energy performance standards. We are currently evaluating chem bio detection technology using a mass spectrometer. Going forward, we expect to provide industry guidance for air refresh procedures to address COVID and other future virus concerns, determine building automation management procedures and guidance for incident response, and deliver cost neutral return on investment for public safety measures versus building energy performance standards. Thank you for your interest and back to you, John. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. You know, those are things that people probably don't think about how uh, R&D can actually have such a direct impact. So that was a great example of how R&D dollars play a role in directly protecting our communities and our way of life. Now, up next, our next presenters help to discover and transition technologies to bomb squads and SWAT teams across the country through their strong relationships with federal, state, and local operators, including the National Bomb Squad Commander's Advisory Board and the FBI's Hazardous Devices School. Young Hee Kim and Bill Stout are s and Program Managers for the Response and Defeat Operations Support Program, or Red Ops. Over to you guys. I thank you for the opportunity to share one of DHS's most impactful programs supporting our nation's first responders. First slide, please. As technology advances in robotics, 3D printing, drones, and augmented reality, operators are presented with new threats and possible tools to counter them. A key challenge is how these emerging technologies apply to their mission, at what price, and to what outcome. Equipment is often extremely expensive to buy and integrate into operations. To address this, we launched the Response and Defeat Operation Support Program, or Red Ops, to help bomb squads fill identified capability gaps with new and emerging technologies that work. The first Red Ops project is the Bomb Squad Testbed, whereby we partner with state and local bomb squads to assess equipment against operational needs. This critical program provides squad with consumer report style products, so purchase decisions can be made with unbiased and validated data. 
We receive overwhelmingly positive feedback from squads that no longer just rely on vendor claims to make procurement decisions. As an example, NYPD changed the procurement after reading that a system that they selected didn't work in urban areas. Also, the photo at the top left of the slide shows robots and bomb technicians at an assessment of medium-sized robots in Ventura County, California. Next, we launched micro R&D. As the name implies, micro focuses on small, innovative solutions. Bomb technicians often invent new tools to solve their problems. We recognize that squads across the country probably have similar needs that each in invention fulfills, and micro was born. We partner with hundreds of bomb squads across the country to identify and validate these inventions and turn them into DIY tools that are approved by the FBI and integrated into the Hazardous Devices School. So far, more than 40 DIY tools are published and more than 200 bomb squads have built them as shown at the top center of the slide. The top right of the slide is an example of a tool called the Remote Power Hawk that was recently used by the San Francisco Bomb Squad on a homemade explosive laboratory response. Following the success of the Red Ops program, we launched the Research and Prototyping for Tactical Operations Project, aka Raptor, to deliver testbed and micro R&D to the tactical community. One involving SWAT and bomb squad operation conducted in New York City is shown at the bottom left of the slide. We also published the first three micro R&D tools just this year, and the builds are shown at the center bottom of the slide. The lower right photo shows a recent joint Red Ops and Raptor assessment of U.S. manufactured drones. In closing, I want to stress that the Red Ops and the Raptor programs uniquely touch the daily lives of operators throughout the U.S. These are the programs that they not only benefit from, but they also contribute to. It's a true partnership between the federal R&D groups and the state and local operators who we serve. Now, I will pass to Bill Stout, who will speak about the Rapid program that falls under the Red Ops umbrella. Thank you. Thanks, Young King. I appreciate it. So the RAP, the research and prototyping for IED defeat uh, effort is an interagency partnership with the FBI and the Department of Defense that was started in 2012 uh, to support first responder state and local bomb squads in the United States. It's the only program that really does this in the federal government, uh, along with the Red Ops stuff. The rapid focus is on advanced research, development, testing, and evaluation of render safe capabilities that bombs technicians makes their job more effective, more efficient, and most importantly, safer. Our customers are the 3,200 certified bomb technicians that make up the 467 public safety bomb squads across the country. I'd like to point out that the Department of Homeland Security has no bomb technicians, so providing direct support to state and local bomb squads rapid enhances response capability to DHS operational components. On average, bomb squads respond to somewhere between 12 and 15,000 calls for service annually. The tactics used by the bad guys are constantly changing, attempting to over overcome our current countermeasures, so RAPID must constantly reevaluate our render safe tactics, techniques, and procedures. A good example of RAPID's development of, is the Special Purpose Low Impact Threat Rupture System, or SPLITTER, in 2015, Al-Qaeda's Inspire magazine published an article saying U.S. bomb squads had a problem defeating elbow pipe bombs with internally threaded caps. In response, Rapid developed a splitter pipe cutter tool, which is extremely effective in neutralizing elbow pipe bombs with internally threaded caps. So splitter is now a common tool used by bomb squads across the United States. RAPID has a robust transition plan for tools and knowledge products. These include uh, leveraging the FBI's Hazardous Devices School in Huntsville, Alabama. We also conduct Advanced Disablement Engineering Technology Transition Seminars, or ADETs, and we have the Rapid X events, which are scenario-based functional exercises. The Hazardous Devices School is a critical element to our transition process. As it indicates on the slide, there are five, these are five of many tools that have been inserted into the HDS curriculum, which means every bomb technician moving through the Hazard Devices School certification and recertification programs are exposed to these tools and learn how to use them. In addition, we have published several special technician bullish bulletins 
knowledge products through the FBI's Law Enforcement Enterprise Portal, or LEAP, to our, that our customers have immediate access to. Thank you for letting me talk about RAPID, and I'll turn it back over to John. Hey, thank you so much, Bill and Byung-Hee, for all the work that you do to keep us safe. And now I have the distinct honor to introduce a very special guest, Congresswoman Yvette D. Clark, who serves as the chair of the House Homeland Security Committee's Cybersecurity, Infrastructure Protection, and Innovation Subcommittee. Congresswoman Clark, we know you stepped out of an important committee meeting to be here, so we are extremely thankful for your time today and for your continued support of the department and the nation's first responders. Good morning, and thank. let me thank the DHS Science and Technology Directorate for putting together this event to discuss the important work that ST is doing by investing in research and development to help first responders save lives and better serve the public. I'm Congresswoman Yvette D. Clark, and I proudly represent New York's 9th Congressional District in Brooklyn. In my capacity, as co-founder and co-chair of the Congressional Smart Cities Caucus, I'm dedicated to leveraging technological advancements and innovations to make American communities more equitable, sustainable, and resilient in this digital age. Smart technologies, such as those that have been highlighted in today's discussion, can enable communities to improve critical public services by assisting first responders with advanced emergency response systems and connected networks. And let me say how just very proud I am of this work uh, as someone who served on the municipal level right in the wake of 9-11, I know how far we've come in terms of meeting the demands and the needs of our first responders. Whether there's a natural disaster, a medical emergency, a public safety threat, we rely on first responders from, th from thousands of departments and agencies across the nation to keep our communities safe. However, we cannot leave the development and testing of new technologies to resource constrained state and local governments alone. Instead, the federal government must step up to partner with first responders and private industry to develop innovations that will facilitate more effective emergency response that also protects our frontline heroes. Since the creation of DHS nearly two decades ago, the Science and Technology Directorate has spearheaded research and development efforts to protect our homeland. Now, with climate change increasing the threat of catastrophic weather events, modern technologies like unmanned aircraft systems pose new, new risks and a growing threat of domestic violent extremism. SNT's work is more important now than ever. As chairwoman of the House Homeland Security Committee's Subcommittee on Cybersecurity, Infrastructure Protection, and Innovation, I'm committed to ensuring that SNT has the resources it needs to continue to expand its vital research and development efforts. Today's discussion has highlighted and will highlight the achievements that have been made in recent years and will demonstrate the importance of enhanced support for continued innovation. While learning more about ST's work, encounter unmanned aircraft technologies, opioids detection, early warning and detection services, and improvised explosive device response has highlighted just some of what s and is doing to assist first responders and will help those of us in Congress better understand how to support s and research. I look forward to hearing uh, uh, what our first responders have said here today, and I'm including my own hometown, Brooklyn, New York, on how s and research and development is helping keep Americans safe and how we can continue to build on s and successes going forward. So let me just thank you once again. Uh, my thanks to s and for organizing today's event, and I look forward to continued conversations of the innovation and the technology that's taking us into the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Clark. 
uh, you know, Brooklyn is my hometown too. So say hi to Coney Island for me. Uh, and thank you also for taking the time to join us and for your continued support of DHS and the s &T. Greatly appreciate it. And I know, we, I know you've got to get back, but hopefully you can stick around and, and listen in while we go to our next session. Greatly appreciate it, your time so much. Thank you for so, having me. Thank you. And thank you to all of our presenters. We're going to now go to our Ask s and segment so we can take a few questions uh, from the chat. We don't have uh, too much time, but we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. For the questions that we don't get to during the actual live broadcast, we will capture the questions from the chat and post those questions and answers on our Capitol Hill Showcase webpage. So I know that there have been some questions popping into the chat and uh, some of my colleagues have been monitoring uh, and, and keeping track of it. So let me ask uh, Nick, I know you've been monitoring the chat. Can you, uh, do we have any questions in there? Yes, John, uh, we do have a few questions and it looks like our first question is for the Red Ops team. And the question is, how do bomb technicians obtain rapid tools or knowledge products? Uh, let me start off with this. Uh, so Red Ops and Rapid, we work closely with our federal partners, with the FBI, DOD, and also uh, our component Office of Bombing Prevention to get these uh, knowledge products out to our customers. So our primary source is the Law Enforcement Enterprise Portal, which is hosted by the FBI, that a lot of our uh, bomb squad related tools are housed in. And then also the OBP tripwire system that um, uh, has that houses a lot of uh, the tactical uh, knowledge products. We also attend uh, events like Ravens Challenge exercises and also training conference to uh, teach uh, our customers how to build micro tools and talk about the assessment. Uh, Bill, do you have anything more to add? Yeah, for rapid, we have three primary uh, vehicles to do that. One is our ha the hazard devices school down in Huntsville, Alabama, where all the bomb techs go through for their certification and recertification programs. We insert our tools into that curriculum. Second is our advanced disablement classes that we do to uh, transition the rapid tools. And then third is the rapid X scenario based functional exercises. So uh, bomb techs get these uh, tools immediately as soon as we get them uh, approved and ready to go. Terrific, thank you, uh, both of you, uh, Byung Hee and Bill. Thank you. Hey, hey Nick, are, are there more questions? Do we have another one? Yes, John, we do have another one here, and it looks like it's for the CUAS team, and it says, can s and do all CUAS testing in a lab environment or at a single test site? Yeah, good question. Uh, I wish we could use just one location. From a lab testing perspective, we need a variety of specialized test resources. So if you remember back when I talked just a few minutes ago, um, I talked about using anechoic chambers. Um, those are very specialized uh, resources that are not readily available across the US. Um, we also do uh, special cyber testing, again, needing very specialized equipment and, and or a specialized test facility. Then from an operational perspective, the equipment performance depends on three major items. One is the physical environment. So is it like an open desert or is it an urban city? Two is the topography or the terrain. Is it uh, hilly uh, or mountainous or is, it, is the ground flat? Um, and then third, the specific use case. So is it, does it involve like protecting a, a fixed facility or is it like a large swath of, of the southwest border that has to be protected? So it's definitely not a one size fits all. Uh, therefore, you know, we're required to, to test our equipment in many different types of labs and oper operational locations to ensure that the equipment is uh, both effective and safe to use. Excellent, thank you, Sean, appreciate it. Uh, I think we've got time for one more, uh, Nick. Do we have another one? Yes, John, we do. And it looks like this final question is for the opioid detection team. And it says, knowing the opioid crisis is on the rise and communities are at great risk, what role do R&D partnerships with the DHS national labs play in developing new capabilities and essential resources to keep first responders safe and secure? Thanks, Nick. Uh, the s and labs that we've, we've talked about today, like CSAC and New Steel, as well as our transportation security lab, they provide us with critical subject matter expertise, the testing facilities, um, as well as access to end user communities that enable us to, to both focus and maximize our resources on the most critical and impactful research and development efforts. 
Well, thank you again, Rosanna. Appreciate it. Uh, I think that's all that we have time for as far as live questions uh, during our live broadcast. But we're going to keep the link, the chat link open for a little while after our program if you'd like to submit any additional questions. And like I said, we're going to take those questions and answer them and post them in a document on, on our website uh, along with this video for you to review again. So thank you again uh, for all of our guests to our congressional partners and for the first responder community and the participants for joining us today. Uh, to find out more information about these programs and technologies, please visit the virtual first responder Capitol Hill showcase page on the ST website and we'll place the link on the screen. Thank you guys. Uh, and also uh, in the chat. Now I'd like to turn to my ST colleague Paul McDonough. Uh, who and our guests from the first responder community to give us some final perspectives and our last word. As I said at the outset of our conversation, you are why we're all here. So I turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Appreciate all of your time. Well, thank you again, John, and thanks for the support here today. And to our first responders, um, thank you for being here and for turning on your cameras one last time so we can all get a good look at you. Uh, we only have a few minutes left, so uh, this is going to be a little bit of a lightning round question. And uh, so looking for rather brief responses, but in the context of why does today matter? What is your takeaway for our audience here today? What should they be communicating back home or thinking about uh, from the first responder per perspective? Excuse me. And so I'll again, start with Dr. Cunningham. Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, the loss of EMS providers due to illness, injury, and death is magnified by the COVID-19 pandemic is a stark reminder that we are a limited resource. Uh, when one's life is hanging in the balance, the EMS system is invaluable. Uh, the products developed by ST are both affordable and sustainable. And as a result, your investment in DHS ST enables these technologies to be in the hands of first responders where they support the safety and maintenance of our workforce in every community of our nation. Thank you. Okay, that very powerful. Thank you for that. Inspector Dooley, how about you? What would you like to add? Yeah, same thing as Carol, right? So New York City, NYPD, city that never sleeps, a lot goes into helping us accomplish our mission. I'm confident, the NYPD is confident. With FRRG, we have the help that we need and the support that we need, so thank you. Thank you for that, appreciate that. Uh, Steve, our rescue paramedic from the southwest there. Um, I know your your camera's not working too well today, and I, I understand that, but is there anything you'd like to end with today? I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be able to bring things to a group in the, in the federal government as a local operator. I mean, we, we're in your community, 150 subject matter experts. A lot of them are from volunteer departments that do the majority of firefighting in our country. And we have them here also, people from EMS and law all together. And after 9-11, we call them 912 corporations because people would throw these products out at us that people were spending money on and they didn't do anything for us. But now for it to come from the response community and be able to say, hey, this is something we really need. And this is what it looks like for everyone across the country. And then to see if there's a new technology that, that can fulfill this capability gap. There's just nothing else like it in the country. There's nothing else that does that for us. Well, thank you. That's that's very kind. And and first, I want to say thanks for serving uh, our communities and thank you for sharing your thoughts with us here today. Um, I got to tell you, it's an honor to continue to serve the first responder community through DHS. And I want you guys all to know and everyone online here to know that DHS is there to support you at the local level, because in the truth, you're our first level of Homeland Security. So it doesn't matter which arena it is. Now, to our guests, uh, please look at the online links that were posted in the chat box as we went through today. Uh, obviously, you can go to dhs.gov slash publication slash FRRG, which stands for First Responder Resource Group. Or you can just go to the DHS webpage and go through the search bar and type in first responders, and it'll start throwing you through some of the links there. Um, we are gonna stick around a little bit here today uh, to answer a few more questions in the chat box, but. I just want to say thank you for attending here today and have a great afternoon. Thank you very much.